Thank you, James. My name is John Brown. It's a pleasure being with you here this afternoon and inviting me to share with you uh, some research I've done into Richard Lay. So we'll start straight away. And I thought I'd show you this map of 1746. You can recognize it straight away as being Streatham. And if <laughs> I put up the arrow, <laughs> you can see what was Mitcham Lane in the middle of the 1800s. Nothing more really than a small country trackway uh, linking Streatham to Mitcham. You go down Mitcham Lane to the parish border and all of a sudden you come to Streatham Road. Once you're in Streatham Road, you're in the parish of Mitcham and the road leads back to Streatham. In 1746, as I say, it was just a small trackway and we owe the road's um, existence really to a chap called John Wilford, who was a member of the Merchant Tailors Company. He had a house in Sutton and he was so appalled at the state of the road when he was journeying from London to Sutton that he paid to have it made up. And that means that somebody would have filled the potholes with stones, they would have put faggots down, that's bundles of branches and so on, when the road was muddy and, and uh, swampy, and he would pay this. And when he died, his son, James Wilford, who was also master of the Merchant Taylors Company, left a legacy of a huge amount of money so that the road could continue to be repaired every year. And the road from Streatham all the way down to Sutton was repaired annually at a cost of 13 pounds. <laughs> and that was his biggest. <laughs> and how the money was paid out was that uh, once every four years, each of the four parishes, which is Streatham, uh, Sutton, uh, Mitcham, and Carshorton, all received the 13 pounds. And in 1833, there was a huge meeting held at Carshorton Church, and it was decided that that would be how the money would be paid in perpetuity, i.e. forever. And that was 1833, and the first payment was made to Streatham then, and by my reckoning, we get our next £13 in uh, 2024. <laughs> However, it was subsequently decided that the 13 pounds no longer filled one pothole, let alone the, <laughs> the whole road. So now the money is, is given to the councils and it's just added to their, their general fund. <laughs> so what I thought we would do is we'd start at the um, north end of Mitcham Lane, us at Lenders Church, and we'll just go down the road and I'll point out places of interest and tell you something about their history. And of course, there we see a picture of um, <laughs> St. Lenders Church, probably painted about 1746, the date of the map, and it shows Streatham as a small parish church uh, in, a, in a country setting. And those of you who, who know Streatham can see a hill in the distance. <coughs> my my doodle's not working, oh yes it is. No, it's not working, so I'll get up and point it out to you. And this hill here is the great Sunny Hill, after which Sunny Hill Road is named. And another view of the church slightly later, about 50 years ago, showing that junction between Streatham High Road, two Tibet Gardens with Mitcham Lane going off to the left. And as you can see, the fastest thing on the road is a man with his old nag going down the road uh, to Croydon. And on the left, we can see the old Streatham Forge, which was at the junction of Mitcham Lane. And we can actually see a man shoeing a horse there. And we can actually know who he is. His name is William Street. He was the blacksmith. I think what's interesting about this painting is you can see his wife keeping an eye on him from the, uh, from the kitchen door, <laughs> making sure that he's not up to uh, any trouble. A lovely painting. We discovered this in Croydon archives and the description of the painting was just a church near Croydon. And of course we recognize it as being Streatham. Um, and so that was a wonderful discovery for us to have made. The forge, was in existence, we know, in the 1600s. Here's a picture of it in the 1850s. It's on the left-hand side, and it really continued into operation until the early 1900s. And next door to the forge, just behind it, was the village lockup. In the days before the Metropolitan Police Force was established in 1829, each 
parish had their own village constable and they normally had what was called a lockup. And so if you were caught drunk in the street, they were throwing you in the lockup overnight <laughs> until you sobered up and released you in the morning. And Streatham's lockup was behind the forge, and we can see it in this picture that was drawn about 1908-1909. A small square room, it was about seven foot square, it had bars around the windows, and it had a large studded door to confine the vagrants. And we have a picture of the door, there it is, um, of the old lockup. This was put on exhibition in Streatham in 1933, and that was the last time we saw the door. It, it just disappeared after there. But you can see how old it is, the wood's rotting away, but see the studs, it's been really made so that a man can't sort of break out of the forge, uh, of, of the lockup. And that was uh, on the junction of Streatham High Road and Mitcham Lane. Now, as we go down Mitcham Lane, which is on the left there, we come to the first open space, and that is uh, Streatham Green. The green dates back to beyond medieval terms, and it used to be a place basically of recreation uh, for the village. Our village green is gradually shrinking over the years. It used to be roughly twice the size it is today, but when the roads are widened and, and, and the like, so a little bit of the green is taken away. And next door to the green uh, was, or opposite the green, was Bedford Row. And this was a, a row of ancient shops um, that was Streatham's High Road, named after the Duke of Bedford, who was the Lord of the Manor, and then lining the green with these four massive elm trees that we can see uh, here uh, in this quarry. And when those elm trees were chopped down in the early 1900s, when the road was widened, somebody had the patience to count the rings and found out they were over 400 years old. I think they probably lost their count at 400 and decided not to go back and and do the counting again. But they were ancient trees going back to Tudor times. Now, adjacent to the green was the old manor house. And this map shows us Mitcham Lane here. It shows us the old manor house and it shows us St. Leonard's Church. Except the manor house wasn't the manorial house for Streatham. It was just a large prominent building that adopted the name to add prestige to it for somebody's home. The Ranner House for Streatham was down by Streatham Common. And as you can see, it's quite a large building. It had been extended several times. These wings have obviously been added at a later date. So the middle part there would be the original uh, part of the house. Extended by a brandy merchant called Abraham Pitches, who um, his family never ceased to grow. Yeah, I think he had six daughters and a couple of sons. And so every time his wife uh, gave birth, so they added a bit more onto the, the house. And it was his widow, Lady Pitches, that tried to absorb the green into her garden. She thought it would be nice if I could have it as my front garden. Mm -hmm. And so she fenced it in. And the villagers of Streatham rose up as one man and one woman and wrote to the Duke of Bedford, complaining that they had been denied uh, the green. And the Duke of Bedford uh, insisted that she take down the fence and it become the open space. Her main gripe was that people carrying coffins up the hill to go to the church uh, would pause outside her house. <laughs> it was a steep hill <laughs> and they're heavy coffins. And this was something that wasn't really to her liking. And there is a picture, a closer, a larger picture of the manor house. And what I find fascinating as somebody who's been looking at Streatham's history now for um, you know, 40, 50 years, is this picture only came to light 10 years ago. And it was offered to the Streatham Society um, as a raffle prize. And Elizabeth Barrett, a lady who lives in Bannon, won it. And it's now in her, in her hallway. Now, the manor grounds were quite extensive. And when Manor Park was developed, which borders on Mitcham Lane and goes all the way down Babington Road to Conyers Road, um, it was developed as a private estate. And to get into the estate, you had to go down Babington Road through the gates we see on the left. And on the right, we see the lodge house. And that's where the gatekeeper lived. And so when a horse and cart arrived to go down into the manor park, he would come out and open and close the gates. That was basically his job. And then there was this lovely architectural feature of the tower from which you could see you know, all the way down to Epsom, the Epsom Downs and up to London, which was just 
put onto the building to lend it some sort of prestige and some sort of uh, stature. And pictures going up to the 19, mid 1920s um, show uh, that building. The later pictures show it plastered with posters and billboards. Um, but it was demolished in the early 1920s to make way uh, for the Manor Park Arms. Before the pub was built, there was a beer shop on the corner. And this is the only picture we have of the beer shop, probably taken, I think, in the 1870s. So it's a bit old and that's why it's a bit musty. But I would draw your attention to the man resting up against the pony and trap by the beer shop. And that is the publican or the beer shop owner, Mr. Harrington, and the rep from the brewery. And what would happen is the rep from the brewery would come down for lunch. Um, Mr. Harrington would get him as drunk as he possibly could so that he could beat him down for the price of the beer. And then the, he would put him in his trap and then the trap, the horse would go down the, the Richard Lane to the Stretton Park Tavern. And then the representative would again have a good nosh up and plenty of beer. Oh. And, making his way to Mitchum to sell his beer. I think it's a lovely picture, comes from the great grandson of, uh, of the old public from there. But in 1925, the beer shop was demolished, the tower was demolished, and the uh, lovely pub we have today, the Manor Park Arms was built on the site. An interesting pub, because it was designed by a, a famous, inverted commas, pub architect, who did a number of pubs up in Hull, in the First World War, there was tremendous concern about uh, workers uh, drinking. And so the government nationalised all the pubs, I think it was in Hull, one of the Northern Towns, uh, to see whether they could control drinking as a consequence of doing, owning the pubs. And um, later on, they just brought in licensing laws, i.e. the pubs close at 12 o'clock or 3 o'clock, you can't drink out of these hours. But their estate, their pub estate, was in existence for about 80 years. And as time passed, many of those pubs were rebuilt by this architect who did Manor Park Arms for us. And in the front, the dome area, was a, what they call a winter garden. It was a palm sort of area, a nice place uh, to, to be. Um, and those pubs existed and survived as part of the, the government's uh, estate until Margaret Thatcher came into power, discovered that she owned a, a brewery and about 150 pubs and decided to <laughs> sell them all off. She didn't think it was appropriate. Um, uh, but I think it's a lovely building and one of our nicest modern pubs in Stratford. And opposite the pub, of course, we have the South London Islamic Centre. Uh, only a part of the building survives because it was bombed in the war. Uh, previously, as some of you may well know, it was the fire station. And here we can see uh, the, the Sterling members of the Stretton Fire Brigade uh, with their horse drawn vehicles, a photograph taken shortly after the station was opened in uh, 1904. And it's interesting in that, to the best of my knowledge, Stretton Fire Station was the only fire station that was opened by the head of the LCC Fire Brigade during the ceremony of which the fire brigade was summoned to a fire. <laughs> so the, all the dignitaries are there, the tables are there with the sandwiches and the beer and everything, and then the bell rings and they have to take the appliances up to Newport Road, leaving the chair of the London Fire Brigade to declare an empty fire station open. And worse still, the firemen come back after putting out the fire in Newport Road, the beer's been drunk, the sandwiches have been eaten and everyone's gone home. So it really is uh, quite a, an exciting day for the firemen where they didn't get their, their beer and sandwiches. And um, here's just a, a, a contemporary drawing of a steamer uh, going to the farm. The Stretton Fire Station held the record for responding to a call for many years. When the bell rent went, you've got to harness the horses and you've got to get them out of the station. And it took the Stretton Fire Brigade 45 seconds to harness the horses and get both the steamer, that's the pump, and the ladders out of the station. And one of these reasons was that they had what they called a drop harness. The harness was suspended above the ceiling, the horses were brought out and the harness was dropped down and just collect and off we went. But I think 45 seconds, they can't get a fire brigade engine out of Warbley Place at a fire station in 45 seconds. So it must have been quite a sight to see. 
Sadly, <coughs> in the war, the fire station was bombed and we lost half of the building and tragically 12 people were killed in that incident. And then, of course, in the 1970s, the station was closed and moved down to Norbury. On the junction of Mitchell Lane and Tudor Beck Gardens was this very large house called Russell House, again named after the Dukes of Bedford, because the Russells <coughs> was the family name of the uh, Dukes of Bedford. And when digging on that site for the building of the Church of the English Martyrs, they found this small Roman votive figure of Venus. And you can see he's sort of holding his hand in a peculiar position. Uh, what you would do is you would rest that on the side of a great big urn uh, and incense would burn and that would be your offerings. And that suggests that at that site, there was a Roman settlement. Um, and it was quite common for churches to be built on the sites of pagan significance. And that's why St. Leonard's Church was probably built where it was, dating back to Saxon times. But a Roman link there on the site of the Roman Catholic Church Lovely church built in the 1890s, uh, designed by a Mr. Purdy. And if you look very closely, you can see on the right hand side there the electricity substation and the original position of the dice fountain. And adjacent to the church, of course, was the presbytery. Built in the 1890s, the first time there had been a Roman Catholic church in Stretton for over 450 years. Because prior to that, the Roman Catholic Church, of course, was the parish church of St. Leonard's. And I often remind the, my friend who is the, the priest at the Roman Catholic Church that St. Leonard's has been a Roman Catholic Church far longer than his church <laughs> as a consequence. And inside the church, we have the two heads of Mr. and Mrs. Measures, um, who gave considerable sums of money to cover the cost of the building of the church. So they are immortalized inside. And there is a picture of what people think is a chapel to the church, but is in fact a grade two listed electricity substation. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, the only listed substation in the country. And it was a condition of the building of that substation that it was designed to fit in with the architecture of the church, designed by a chap called Frederick Wheeler and erected so that there was ample electricity so that the trams could go down the high road. And there's another closer view of the High Ridge stretch and the Bedford Row shops I showed you earlier. On the junction of the road was the Dice Fountain, which used to stand um, there when it was erected in 1860 until it was moved in 1933 uh, to Streatham Green when the road was widened. This is the original design of what Streatham's Fountain was going to be. Designed by William Dice, a very famous um, Victorian artist, uh, but this was considered to be um, inappropriate for Shretham at that time, and the fountain that we have today was considered a more um, worthy uh, design. Uh, it was also several hundred pounds cheaper, and I think that was probably the motivating effect of its choice. Um, recently renovated, um, it has uh, wonderful mosaic features on it. Uh, and it was uh, a fountain that was used quite regularly, um, really up until the time of the First World War, when people traveling down the road wanted refreshment, they used to be able to uh, gain water there. And there was a little trough at the bottom for dogs to drink. This is a picture of William Dice, famous artist, famous artist and favorite of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Uh, a couple of years ago, one of his, Paintings of the Madonna and Child was used as a Christmas stamp. And in fact, he is the only artist where his painting of the Madonna and Child had been used for two consecutive years as a Christmas stamp. And both of the stamps, two of his stamps have been used, paintings have been used for that purpose. He did a third painting to so keep your eyes open. That must be coming up for use as a stamp pretty quickly. A very famous man, he designed the original two bob bit. Um, the Tempany piece as we know it today. And he was also responsible for doing the murals in the uh, Houses of Parliament. And this is in the robing room uh, in the Palace of Westminster, showing you some of his work. And he also did a very famous mural of Britannia surrendering the crown of the sea, um, which is on the wall 
of the staircase leading up to the royal bedchamber at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. Now, in Mitcham Lane, there used to be a very small school, and it was what was known as a Dale school. It dated back to the 1700s when Elizabeth Howland, who was a wealthy resident of the parish, left a sum of money to pay for a sober lady to teach 12 girls the alphabet. And this is a small school uh, that, that she used. For boys, there was no school. If you didn't pay for your education, you got no education. And so it was decided to open a boys' school in about 1813 uh, in the hayloft of the White Lion Park, East West High Road. The only problem was uh, that occupying the hayloft meant that all the horses were going in and out of the stables above the hayloft. Um, and you not only had the smell and the muck to walk through, but you had the noise of the stable boys and the coachman. And in January 1837, um, an inhabitant wrote to the Times saying that this was quite inappropriate, that young boys should have to put up with the drunken singing of people in the pub, and that surely a, a posh parish like Stresham should be able to afford its own school. And as a consequence of that, a thousand pounds was raised and a school was built in Mitchell Lane. This is the original school building, and there's the old dame school uh, there. And that was the start of St. Leonard's School as we know it today. And there's a picture taken in the 1860s uh, showing uh, the boys at the school, all boys, because at that time the parish school uh, was solely for boys. And then the later date, the two schools merged and boys and girls were taught um, uh, in the same buildings. Now, as we go down Mitchell Lane, we pass the school and we come to Thrail House. Uh, one of the largest uh, buildings that used to stand in Mitchell Lane, and it's on the very edge of the Thrail uh, Stretton Park estate. Oh. There's a picture of Stretton Park House, after which the Stretton Park area is known. You may have seen it before. And that was uh, the home of Henry and Hester Thrail. Uh, when Henry Thrale died, he left the house in trust to his wife for his daughters, and his wife soon afterwards married her daughter's uh, Italian piano teacher, Mr. Piozzi, and we see them there together. She had little use for Stretton Park at the time, so they rented it out. And they rented it out to the Russian ambassador. They rented it out to the prime minister. Lord Shelburne lived there for two and a half years who was Prime Minister, gives you an idea of the status of the house. But because she had no interest in the house herself, it was just a drain on her resources because she held it in trust for her daughters. By the time you get to the 1860s, it was in quite a bad state of repair. And so it was decided to knock the house down and sell the land off for development. And that's when um, this little corner of the estate was acquired and Thrale House was erected on the site. Uh, originally, it, had, it uh, was occupied by a school. This is a school that used to stand opposite Stretton Green, and it was called, in those days, Granville House. And the man who operated the school there did so well, he needed larger premises, so he moved down Mitcham Lane to the new school he built at Thrale Hall, and this later became Stretton Grammar School. And there is a picture of Thrale Hall uh, when it was a hotel, a very large building, and for many years, a very successful school. When the owner died, and Mr. Hesterman took it over, and it became a hydropathic establishment. People would go there for water treatment and water cures. Um, and that, again, was a successful enterprise until he moved on and the building was taken over and became a hotel. And as you can see, you get a good idea from this map, where I've highlighted in red, just how large an establishment it was. Um, it was extended twice because it had two wings to it, um, and was the largest hotel in Streatham right up to the 1960s. And here we can see Madame Florence standing on a huge rubber ball. And Madame Florence got on her ball in London and she walked it all the way to Brighton. And she never, her feet never left the ball. 
And when she got to the junction of Streatham High Road and Mitcham Lane, she had what was known as a comfort stop. Two men went either side of her and lifted her off the wall. <laughs> and they carried her, without her feet touching the road, down to the Thrale Hall Hotel, where she had her comfort stop. And then they lifted her back onto the ball. <laughs> and she had three balls, if you pardon the expression. She had a ball that she used to take her uphill. She had a rubber ball to take her downhill. And she had a ball to take her on level ground. And she walked all the way from London to Brighton. You couldn't make this up, could you? Really? <laughs> <laughs> Why did she do it? Well, that's what they did in those days. There's no television. It was a sunny day. <laughs> and there she is coming into Red Hill or Rygate, one of those towns, walking on her ball. Um, and here's a picture we, we can see uh, the owner of the Fair Hotel, Mr. Higgins, and a car there parked outside uh, the establishment. As a hotel, as I say, the building continued in use up until the 1960s. It had some interesting clientele. Uh, in 1913, uh, the um, Sunderland football team um, stayed there whilst competing in the FA Cup final in Crystal Palace. They lost, um, uh, but nonetheless, um, it gives you an idea of the sta status of, of the hotel at that time. And then in the 1950s, Countess Mountbatten, um, came down to the Fair Hotel, hotel where there was a, a major dinner to mark the 50th celebration of the St. John's Ambulance Association in, in Stratton. There's a picture of her there um, taken at that luncheon. And here we have um, two uh, Mr. and Mrs. Um, Waters um, standing either side of a lamp that was presented to them um, by the inhabitants of the hotel on the occasion of their golden wedding. Rather unusual really that people living in a hotel would come together to give the, the manager a prize, but that was it. Um, it was an extensive site. There were tennis courts at the back. There was even a croquet lawn at one time. Um, but by the time you get to the 1960s, the need for that size of hotel in Stratton um, uh, was fast disappearing. This is a picture of Mrs. Campbell, who was the last owner of the hotel, um, and she sold it to the Chinese. And for about um, five or six years, the Third Hotel became a part of China because it was a diplomatic office and therefore Chinese soil. Um, and it was there that the Chinese government housed their inspecting engineers for mining equipment and railway stock they were buying from Britain. And then it was demolished, and on the site was built Campbell Close, named after Mrs. Campbell, uh, the last owner of the establishment. Opposite the hotel was Manor Park Terrace, which was a row of uh, quite large houses, uh, two of which survive today, and we see them there. Um, the one on the left for a time was the George Blount home <coughs> in Stratton. That was a home for orphan children uh, for Roman Catholic families. Um, and it continued to operate for many years uh, until the boys were decanted into a larger house <coughs> up the road. And adjacent to those buildings was this rather unusual row of houses. I think that we're looking at the back of the houses. I think the front <coughs> of the properties was the back and the back became the front because the backs of these properties opened out onto Manor Park, which was an area of open ground. So we are in fact looking at the back entrances. And as you can see, even in this picture, they were quite dilapidated. Uh, but some important people lived there. Um, so Ernest George and his parents lived there for a time. Ernest George was an architect, president of the Royal Institute of Christian Architects. Uh, Sir Kings Mulkey lived there for a time. Uh, his father was Lord Mayor of London twice, um, and he lived uh, uh, originally at the rebuilt manor house up by Streatham Green. We can see a picture of the rebuilt manor house shortly before its demolition there. And his son, uh, Kings Mulkey Jr., was a very famous cricketer and was captain of the Surrey side in the 1890s. Uh, and he used to practice cricket <coughs> on Streatham Common. 
Excuse me. Yes. Sorry. Sorry to butt in. No. I've got to leave. Could I just introduce you to our living piece of history? Yes. It's just a white, isn't it? It's a privilege to have all of this. 102 years old and Excellent. still got all these marbles. Right. Uh, well, you're doing much better than me, sir. It's a real joy to have you with me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm talking about these old pictures, but you must have memories of some of the pictures I'm showing yes, from your, your boyhood days in your early years. So if I make a mistake, you shout out and put me right. I'm looking forward to when we get to Pigs Marsh. All oh, right, don't quite go that far. <laughs> but a real pleasure and a joy to have you here today, sir. Lovely to be introduced to you. Um, so those old buildings in Manor Park Terrace were originally demolished, and that's the buildings which occupy the site today. Uh, originally, there used to be a garage at the site of number 45, uh, Mitcham Lane, and we can see some of the uh, large cars here. Stretton was a very prosperous suburb, uh, suburb in the early 1900s, 1920s, and therefore some of the very early garages to be established along the London to Brighton Road, um, we had a couple of them here in Stretton. To own a car in those days, you had to be quite a wealthy person. And during the war, the engineering site there, which ran the garage, um, made parts for the uh, Mosquito Fighter. Um, and I think I've got in my records that they made sort of things like 15,000 starters uh, for the Mosquito planes. So during the war years, many Stretton industries were converted to war production. Now there we see the site of the garage today, still operating as a car garage, but with more modern vehicles. And next door to it, this building still survives, which was used as a temporary fire station in the early 1900s, while the station we looked at earlier was being constructed. When they were building the original Stretton fire station, they had a small cabin on the junction of Mitcham Lane and Stretton High Road, which acted as an alarm point. And here we can see the cabin, um, and here would be the dice fountain on the right-hand side. And this was the first time in London uh, that the Marconi Telegraph was used to relay fire uh, alarm information. And it was tested in this small wheeled cabin um, at the junction of Mitcham Lane and Streatham High Road. And we can see the apparatus here in situ. Um, and um, that was placed in the, um, the fire station operating from that was placed in the building next to this house. Um, this house is in the part <coughs> of demolition, but it's the only picture I have of it. It was um, situated um, at 43, I think, uh, Mitcham Lane. And one of the former residents of uh, this house was a chap called Pierce Morrison. And he was very famous in his day uh, for the work he did in London. He was an alderman of London, and uh, that building, uh, having been demolished, Colonel Court was built on the site. And he was responsible for giving the freedom of London uh, to Stanley. Stanley was the American explorer who discovered Dr. Livingston in the, um, in the Congo. Um, and when he came back to London, where he was a, a reporter, um, he was granted the freedom of the City of London, which was sponsored uh, by the gentleman there living in Mission Lane. And again, uh, we have these buildings occupying, I think these are Swallow Court, um, which occupied part of the site on which a house stood where Mr. Payne lived. And Mr. Payne owned a firework factory in Mission. Some of you may uh, remember it. In the Victorian period, he was one of a handful of firework manufacturers in Britain. Um, and we've got some lovely pictures taken in the 1930s of his factory um, and of the girls who worked there. My mother briefly worked at Payne's Firework Factory. I should mention that my mother was born before the First World War. So she um, uh, uh, was uh, of that age. Um, and it was quite common for young girls on leaving school to work in the firework factory. It was hard and it was unpleasant work because you were dealing with all manner of chemicals. Um, so my mother only worked there for a couple of years before going to PP Campus. And there is a picture showing uh, part of the site in Mitchell. It was a strange site in many ways. Um, 
They made a lot of fireworks which were shipped to America for the really spectacular firework displays um, that the Americans uh, put on. And they all came from these little wooden huts. I remember the site quite well as a child. Um, you can see the duck balls leading to and from the huts. And the idea was that all these wooden sheds were a distance apart, so that if one shed blew up, uh, it wouldn't affect the whole site. And sadly, sometimes the sheds did uh, blow up. No men were allowed to wear boots. You had to wear slippers. You weren't allowed to smoke. They would take your smokes away from you and so on. So they had quite stringent precautions, but accidents did happen. And here we can see a few more of the girls here holding the fireworks that they produced. Um, Mr. Payne himself living in Streatham. I think this is a lovely picture there. You've got a jack in the box. You've got a lady sort of popping out of the box um, uh, with her arms full of fireworks. Now, next to Mr. Payne's house, uh, we had uh, a building which became um, the, the School of Commerce. And it used to teach people, for example, accounting and typewriting and that sort of thing. And it was situated at 50, 55 uh, Mission Lane. Uh, later, it became the Carisbrook College. Streatham had a number of these institutions, of prep schools and private schools that were in operation. I mean, after all, uh, Streatham Grammar School itself was a, a similar private school as an institution. And um, the Carisbrook Co College remained really in operation right up to the time of uh, the Second World War. And then these buildings were demolished and uh, the drill hall was put up, the TA Centre in Mitcham Lane. As you can see, it was quite a large site. It stretched from Mitcham Lane all the way to Babington Lane. And I have got a photograph of it, of it, of it showing an aerial picture. And you can see Carisbrook Cottage College just before it was demolished in the forecourt of uh, the TA drill hall there. Opposite, we have the Riggendale Road Methodist Church, which um, uh, started off um, as the only Methodist chapel in Streatham. It was designed uh, by Frederick Wheeler and Edward Speed, two famous um, architects of their day. It has, when it was built it, in 1900, it had the largest barrel vaulted ceiling in the country. And that is a ceiling that is suspended on its sides rather than having supports in the middle. Um, Sir Walter Essex, who was a, a very wealthy um, uh, uh, wallpaper manufacturer, was a strong supporter of the church and gave large donations to help it be built. And the original church comprised of this building, uh, which is now used as a church hall. And you can see a part of Frederick Wheeler's sort of design here. Because as you go down Streatham High Road, you'll see some of the buildings also designed by Wheeler have got those sort of lovely flounces uh, <coughs> on them themselves. So we come to the bridge, and here's a picture showing the original bridge, much narrower than it is now, because it was widened in the 1960s, um, uh, and showing you really quite a rural aspect of Mitcham Lane at the turn of the century. And as you come over the bridge, you enter. Uh, the shopping parade in uh, Mitcham Lane. On the corner, we have number 71, which started off as a private house and then was uh, converted um, into a bank because you've got that sort of bank facade. But now, of course, it's Mr. Steed's um, uh, dry cleaning shop. And Mr. Steed does the dry cleaning for Buckingham Palace. And they have the Royal Warrant. I think, I think he lost it because that note has disappeared. Yes, that wasn't because they lost the cleaning contract for uh, Buckingham Palace. It was because somebody stole it. So if any of you got a coat of arms in your garden, we know where it comes from. <laughs> yes, it was up there, I think, only for a matter of months. I took my picture and I went back and it had gone. <laughs> so if you see something, take a picture straight away. Um, opposite, of course, we have Ryland's house, which is the start of a large council estate, which is built on the site of Peed's 
nurseries which used to be there. John Peed was a very famous nursery man in the early 1900s. He had a number of sites in Streatham and in Norwood, um, and he sent his plants all over the world. Um, and you can see some, you know, if you, if you go to the Royal Horticultural Society, they have some of his seed catalogs there, which are like telephone directories. Such was the volume of, of his work. And then, of course, next door, we have Ian A. Waits. It was one of the longest established businesses in Streatham. Sadly, it closed this year, um, partly, I think, due to the restrictions that were brought in during the pandemic. Um, but for many years, for over 100 years, it was one of the longest um, family businesses operating in Streatham. Um, uh, the building itself was erected on the front garden of a large house, which we can see behind it. Um, and now I understand the site is being redeveloped for uh, residential use. Opposite, we have two shops here. It's interesting to note that um, among the clients of Waits, when they were upholstering furniture and selling furniture, were people like Joanna Lumley, and the Saudi royal family and the like. And I find it rather interesting that they may have come down to the Waits shop to buy their furniture, or they could have got a cheap mattress across the road <laughs> at the discount mattress shop. Or they could have gone to the Mediterranean grocery, whose owner didn't know how to spell the word Mediterranean. There's only one R in it. But it gives you an idea of the contrast of the different shops that you get in Mitchell Lane. And there's a picture there of the uh, parade of shops in the Edwardian period leading up to the bridge. And next door, there is this opening that some of you may see. Um, and that was originally the opening leading uh, to uh, the motor car business run by a chap called Harding. There was a family in Streatham called Harding who had a number of business interests. And one, of course, was the garages and the motor works at the bottom end of that opening. Um, this shows you what it is today, um, or was a couple of years ago when Kevin and I explored it. I don't think it's going to be there for much longer. It will almost certainly end up as a block of flats or be developed um, as housing. Because across the road, you may remember they knocked down one of the shops to get to the back where they put these two large blocks of flats. The land at the back being worth far more really um, for residential use and as a retail outlet or a shop. We have at number 109, Mission Lane, Memories of India, or we used to have Memories of India, um, a Indian restaurant. Uh, I have a wonderful collection of leaflets uh, of the Memories of India, which people used to poke through my door. I must live two miles away from the shop, but they still used to deliver their leaflets there. It was famous in its day because the chef there used to be the chef for Mother Teresa of Calcutta until he came to London and operated um, uh, the restaurant there. On the corner of that block of shops used to stand the bakers. And I've got some pictures here, not very good because they've taken from much larger views of the bakery business that operated on that site until the Second World War, when sadly the shop was bombed and subsequently demolished. And now, of course, it's the last, one of the last surviving bomb sites in Streatham, covered uh, with, with hoardings that we see there today. And opposite, we have the first down public house. Um, this again originated as a residential house built at the other end, really, of the Streatham Park estate. And there's a picture of a map going back to the 1860s, just showing that very small house there um, that became the Streatham Park Town. Uh, there's a picture uh, showing the house and uh, the extension to the front um, when it was operating in the early uh, 1900s. In the 1930s, the old 1860 building was demolished and this Tudoresque type building was put up in its place. And as uh, the park tavern, as it was known in the 1950s, the publican here um, was a, a gentleman whose daughter later became a famous actress, and that was Wendy Richards. 
she lived above the pub with her parents. Um, and when she entered the acting profession, um, because you couldn't have the name of uh, an existing actress, her name was Emerton, and there was already an actress called Wendy Emerton, she changed her name to Wendy Richards. And uh, as you know, she was famous for Are oh, You Being Served and EastEnders, and she also appeared in Dad's Army in a couple of episodes uh, as Private Walker's girlfriend. Uh, the pub was later renamed the Samuel Johnson, reinforcing its links with the Stretton Park estate. Uh, Samuel Johnson, of course, being a guest of the Thrales in the 1760s to 80s. Um, and uh, there is a picture of, of the pub when the publican at the time decided to go psychedelic and paint it orange and red. And it was like that for a short period and nobody decided they liked it. And so it reverted back to its Tudor-esque black and white and was renamed uh, the Fernstam. Opposite is the Mark Rise Pharmacy, which is the site of Barclays Bank. And it's an important branch of Barclays Bank because Billy Butlin kept his account there. In the 1920s, Billy Butlin was a showman and he ran fairground type operations. And he won the contract to put on a fairground at Olympia, but he didn't have the money and he couldn't find anybody to back him. But he had a friend called Bob Lakin who operated in Streatham because he um, had a factory for building fairground equipment in Besley Street. So he said to Billy Butlin, well, my bank manager is in Mitchell Lane. He knows the fairground business because he looks after my account. Go down and see. And so Billy Butlin went down to uh, Mitchell Lane to that bank. And the bank manager said, yes, I will back you. And as a consequence of that, Billy Butlin kept his account at Barclays Bank in Mission Lane, even when the account was worth 20 or 30 million pounds. And that was one of the reasons why Barclays Bank continued to operate that branch for many, many years. So if you went up to Fife, uh, Fife or wherever you went for Billy Butlin and you paid by check, your check went through the branch in, uh, in Mission Lane. And Billy Butlin, of course, built uh, a large empire of uh, holiday <coughs> camps and moved away from his fairground operations towards the holiday camp business. But of course, at the holiday camps, he, he operated rides and, and the like to uh, satisfy many of his customers on holiday. And so the manager of Barclays Bank, having secured the Billy Butling account, went on to become the regional manager for Barclays Bank for the whole of the southeast of England as a consequence <laughs> of making that loan. And alongside where the bank used to be is this little pathway known as Potter's Lane, um, named after a farmer called Mr. Potter, who was church warden of St. Leonard's Church. Um, and that lane led to his farm, hence it was called Potter's Lane. There's a picture of St. Leonard's Church at the time. Mr. Potter was church warden there in the 1790s. And next door, of course, is the smallest shop in England. We can see it there as Mr. Wilson's solicitor's office. And there we can see it when it was a sweet shop in the 1920s. And there's a lady standing there. It, when she was standing in the doorway, the shop was so small, you couldn't get into the shop. She would serve you from the doorway. And I don't know whether you can notice there are these sweet machines uh, on the outside of the shop. And some of you may remember them, there, remember them there. So you could actually buy sweets when the shop uh, was closed. Sadly, when uh, she no longer kept up the sweet shop, it became a solicitor's office amongst other things. And what I find quite surprising about the shop, which you can see today, is there's hardly room for you and the solicitor to be in there to sign the will or to you know, get your affidavit. It's so small. And to the best of my knowledge, that is still the smallest shop it's in the smallest room. That's hmm? room. It's got a little room at the back. Uh, has it really? I don't know. I'm going to ask oh, right. I don't think it has. No. No. When I last looked, it just was that slither. Its origins, by the way, is as a fruit cart. A man used to sell fruit on that corner. 
And then they gave <coughs> him permission to put up a shack, and then the shack became the structure that you see, see there today. And on the far corner of that block of shops at the end of Bank Parade, we have the Oasis shop, which started life uh, as two houses that were combined into one of the first cinemas in Streatham. And John Creswell has drawn what cinemas look like in that picture. It was known as the Mitcham, Mitcham Lane uh, Picture Palace, and we can see it there when the, uh, uh, the cinema was opened in the early 1900s. And seats cost threepence, sixpence, ninepence, and a shilling. And then you had uh, four performances a day, and you had special shows put on for children on, on a Saturday, penny, tuppence, and threepence on those occasions. However, the cinema became rather notorious locally, and we get lots of newspaper clippings uh, where there were fights, uh, where drunks would, would uh, uh, throw <coughs> the seats around inside the cinema, and it became a bit of a, a sort of a flea pit cinema. It was taken over by a chap called Crep, who spent a lot of money upgrading the cinema, putting in sound and new equipment. Um, but within a short period, within less than 18 months of doing that, uh, he went bankrupt. And so uh, the cinema closed. But a, a very early example, really, of the cinematograph operating uh, in London. It really closed because we had these very large cinemas, the Odeon, the Gaumont, and the ABC, which were erected in the late 1920s and the 1930s. And you can see by their size and grandeur that a little flea pit cinema in Richard Lane was never going to really compete uh, with those sorts of establishments. Uh, just a little bit further down the road, we have two churches side by side. We have the Baptist Church in Mission Lane, a magnificent building. As you pass it, take a bit of time to look at some of the architectural features. Lovely gargoyle here on the top of the tower. Um, and then opposite the road, we have St. James's Church of England Church with that lovely striped facade on the front. Originally, St. James's started off as being a small chapel in this building, which is the church hall today, at the back of the site. And you can see the notice there saying St. James's Temporary Church. Uh, the foundation stone was laid by Peter Brussy Cow, the owner of the PB Cow rubber factory in Streatham, who made a contribution towards the, the building of the church. And one of the features of the church, which I find quite interesting, is the War Memorial. It used to be inside the church, but when they built a new entrance, it was transferred to the back. And it's a rather unique war memorial in as much as it lists those who lost their lives in the First World War by street rather than by name. And here is just a list of those people who gave their lives in the First World War who lived in Fallsbrook Road. And I think when you see the names listed by street, it gives you a very good idea as to the number of people who were killed during the First World War. You can't pass four or five houses in Fallsbrook Road without one of them having been affected um, uh, during that war. Now, on the corner um, just opposite um, St James's Church, we have number 200 and 27 Richard Lane, and I want to draw your attention to the little boy peering out of the window at the bottom of the house, because he is John Newbery, and John Newbery became very famous in the Second World War as a bomb pilot, and he was awarded uh, the DFC for bringing back his bomber, which had been severely damaged after flying a raid over Germany, um, and returning the plane and the crew safely back to base, for which he received the DFC. Some of you may have remembered him, John Newbury, because he lived only next door to a friend of mine. A very quietly spoken man, you would hardly believe you know, that he had been such a hero um, in the Second World War. And here's a picture of my friend Pat Newby, who lived two doors away from John at number 231 Streatham High Road. Here was a man that really did know his local history, 
he had a collection of some 25,000 Edwardian postcards of Streatham, Tooting, Allen, and the like. And together, Pat and I did about half a dozen books on um, Streatham and the, and the local area. He would provide the postcards and, and I would write the, 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 the text. A very knowledgeable man, very generous um, with his pictures, and many of his local cards are now in the ones with heritage set. Um, library, uh, so they have been um, uh, kept for future generations to enjoy. And these are some of his pictures uh, from his collection. This shows some of the children in Mitcham Lane outside his house, um, probably dated about 1912. And it's surprising just how many children there were about in Edwardian times. Hundreds and hundreds of children, you see, because when the photographer were taking these pictures, he had his camera on a tripod and he had to put a black sheet over his head. And so people were wondering what's going on. So he's standing in the middle of the road here taking this picture. He isn't worried about the traffic knocking him down because there is no traffic. But children would gather and to see what he was up to. And then this is another of his collection, 261 Mitchell Lane, a second-hand furniture dealer. And then the shops at the bottom of Mitchell Lane you see there. Tremendous detail in some of these pictures because the photographer took the negatives on glass plates. And therefore, when you blow up, you get tremendous detail from the negatives um, of the pictures that were taken. And this was the uh, Southcroft Rapery stores. And there is the... Uh, cream dairies, and there is the news agents, which I think is still on the corner of that block there um, at the bottom end of uh, Mitcham Lane. And this is just a small part of a small picture, but you can actually read the placards there, such as the quality of the pictures. And another picture from Pat Luby's collection showing the tram accident um, on the junction of Mitcham Lane and Southcroft Road in 1913, the tram came down Mitcham Lane at a speed and tried to turn the corner too quickly and so toppled over. You would think that there would be casualties, but no, people just got out of the tram and walked away. <laughs> but the tram was badly damaged, but the passengers were OK. Um, now, here is a house, a modern house, right at the end of Mitcham Lane. And uh, on that site used to be this house we see here. Bottom right hand, you can see the tram accident. And this is the house. Um, that we see in the distance there. And living in that house was uh, a young lady and her husband who ran a dog breeding business um, at the back of the house and adjoining the river were kennels. And um, she is quite an interesting lady in many respects uh, because her name was Robert Aileo, which she married in Italian, and her father was Blondin. Blondin, the famous tightrope walker. And it was he who walked on a tightrope across Niagara Falls. It was he that walked on a tightrope across the Crystal Palace. And he used to perform at the Crystal Palace um, during the summer months. You can see him riding his bike on the tightrope. And if you think that is dangerous, there he is wheeling a lion in a wheelbarrow <laughs> across the tightrope. And he had great confidence in his own act because there is his daughter who lived in Mitcham Lane in the wheelbarrow, throwing out roses to the crowds underneath the tightrope at the Crystal Palace. And when at a later date, they said, were you frightened? Well, she said, no, because that's what dad did. You know, she just did it like you do these things on a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> but uh, there we are. Now, one of the final houses, and I'm running a wee bit out of time very quickly, is this one here. And the number of this house, I think, is 293 or 200, no, it's 267 um, Mitchell Lane. It used to be part of an ice cream factory, but it was here that another famous resident lived, and his name was George Cole, a very famous actor. He started off as a boy, as a juvenile actor, and had one of the most successful acting careers in uh, British uh, acting history. Probably best known today for his role in Minder as Arthur Daly, the dodgy car dealer. Um, he starred in a number of films with Alistair Sims, 
And in fact, as a juvenile actor, he was adopted by Alistair Sims um, and lived with him for a number of years. And then we see him again with Alistair Sims as a spiv in one of the Centrinian films. And it was because of his role in, I think, three Centrinian films as the spiv that he was um, decided to be Arthur Davy in the minor films. And there we can see him with George, um, with, um, what's his name? Dennis Waterman, who only died a few uh, weeks yeah. ago. Dennis Waterman, another local lad, uh, born in Elm Road in Clapham. So we bring our journey to an end at Rome Bridge. This is where Mitcham Lane is on the right and the Streatham Road is on the left and the river marks the boundary between Streatham and Mitcham Parishes. We owe the bridge to Thomas Rowe, who was responsible for putting money together to build the bridge. And strangely, Thomas Rowe was also a master of the Merchant Taylor Company. So he was another Merchant Taylor that had interest in the bridge locally. And he paid for the bridge to be built as a consequence of which the coat of arms of the Merchant Taylor Company has always been on that bridge. And there we can see the coat of arms of the company. And there we can see it carved into the stone that's on the bridge today. This is the stone from 1662 when the bridge was rebuilt. This is a picture of the bridge, uh, a drawing of the bridge after it was rebuilt. It's a modern picture that I've copied from something else. And you can see here the stone embedded into the side of uh, the bridge. The bridge has been rebuilt many times. You can see here, really, it's just a bridge over a little stream, um, nothing more than that. Uh, but it does mark the boundary not only between Streatham and Midsham, but also between the LCC and the Surrey County Council. And so you have that plaque with the line marking the boundary. Um, you also have this notice on it, anybody sticking bills or damaging the bridge will be prosecuted, put up by Mr. Weeding, the county clerk almost inviting you to put your graffiti on the bridge, isn't it, really? Um, and here is a picture uh, of the bridge after it was rebuilt in 1906, a drawing at the top, and this lovely painting of a cabbage field. Um, I was going, <clears throat> I was in Mitchell and looking at a, at a second-hand shop, and I saw that picture, and it is painted in 1906, right about, about that time, um, and it's just called a cabbage field in Mitchell. But of course, I recognised the bridge straight away as being Row Bridge. Uh, so I think I splashed out 50 pence or 75 pence on it. Couldn't get me down any lower than that <laughs> to try more. Um, but there we are, one of the earliest paintings, really, of, of the bridge. Um, in 1900, and I've got to go to my notes, I'm afraid. My memory has lost me. Uh, where are we? In 1992, the tentacles of the European Union reached out to Mitcham Lane, and they passed an edict that any bridge on a class of road had to be able to sustain a 40-foot lorry smashing into its parapet. And as a consequence of that, the bridge had to be rebuilt. I don't think there are many 40-foot juggernauts going down Mitcham Lane, but nonetheless, that was the rule. And so the bridge was rebuilt by Wandsworth Council. And here we can see uh, the uh, head of the Merchant Taylors Company unveiling yet another plaque on the bridge, commemorating its rebuild. And you can see the Merchant Taylor stone <laughs> behind him. And the Streatham Society contacted Wandsworth and we said, look, you've got all of these memorials on the bridge that tell its history. Um, what are you going to do with them? And they said, well, we're going to throw them away. And we said, well, why don't you put them all back on the bridge? Mm -hmm. And we were able to convince them uh, to put them all back on the bridge. So I think probably Road Bridge, Mission Lane, has got more plaques on it than any other bridge <laughs> <laughs> I know as a consequence. And Kevin is with us today, and we have to thank Kevin for the picture on the right, because I think this is a lovely picture. This shows Road Bridge, Streatham Road. But look at that wonderful stand of trees. It really gives you an idea of what a rural area this was, you know, just a hundred years ago, really, um, when our dear friend here was just a boy in short trousers <laughs> playing in the streets. Now, I brought along uh, a couple of books today, 
stretch them now and then. It's a picture book, but it's got a chapter on Mitchell Lane. And this afternoon, I'm selling it for five pounds if you would like a copy. And we've also got a heritage trail, which gives you notes. Should you want to walk up and down Mitchell Lane, it will point out some of the things I've mentioned to you today. And lastly, I would like to just inform you that on the 7th of June, Tuesday the 7th of June, at half past seven, at St. Leonard's Church, the Streatham Society will be holding our, our normal monthly meeting. And there is a talk on Streatham Ice Rink, the early years, as part of the Wandsworth Heritage Festival. And you're all very, very welcome to come along um, to that talk, should you wish. I'm sorry, I've overrun by five minutes. Um, but there's Mitchell Lane for you in an hour. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, any questions? Why were they allowed to pull that down? The ice rink? Yeah. Well, like many buildings, it was an Art Deco building, yeah. but it had been altered considerably inside. And as a consequence of that, we couldn't get it listed. Um, for a building to be listed, it has to have many of its original features. And although outside there was little change, inside it had been significantly and substantially altered, mainly in the 1960s when they converted it into the Silver Blades. Um, and, and what many people don't realise is that in 1960, when it was converted into the Silver Blades, um, I think it was done by Mecca, Mecca went up to Blackpool and they bought the whole of the Blackpool illuminations for that year and they brought them down to Streatham and they put them in the ice rink. And some of you may have seen pictures of these wonderful lights oh. in the ice rink. Well, they all came from the Black, Blackpool seafront <laughs> um, to help decorate the, the silver blades. Yes, uh, but we were successful in, in, in a number of instances with that development. Firstly, the Congregational Church survives because it is a listed building. And secondly, we were able to get the um, six Art Deco plaques in the front of the ice rink and the lovely stained glass window, which was over the Streatham uh, swimming pool. You got that? Brilliant. I was just going to ask you about that. Yes, we got that incorporated into the new building. Um, and I should tell you, that wasn't easy to do. You, we all sit here and we think, oh, lovely. That's, but you don't know the difficulty we had. The architect of the new development did not want anything like that in the building at all. It's surprising. Uh, he would only take three of the Art Deco plates, which were renovated. The other three are in my greenhouse. So if anybody knows another site for them, I'd be hand, pleased to hand them on. But you would think that building a new sports centre, the council would jump at the opportunity of having the history going on, but it's not the case in many instances. Many architects don't want their new buildings to be Well, the way that the site has been developed, that was not possible because uh, that Tesco's was there with the flats above and there was no way that the structure of the building would be able to support the new, uh, new building. Um, it's interesting to note that Mr. Law, who owned the ice rink at that time, he bought it off a of Mecca, he owned two plots of land. He owned the plot of land where the ice rink is, going back, and he owned a separate strip of land in front of it, which is known as a ransom strip. And, and he sold the ice rink to the developers and hanged on to the ransom strip in the front with the idea that he was going to get more money again because Tesco's had to buy that ransom strip in the front, which they thought they'd already bought when they bought the ice rink, but they hadn't. <laughs> um, so he was a canny, he was a canny operator. Um, but we now, to the best of my knowledge, we have one of the few leisure centres in the world where you've got an ice rink above or below a swimming pool, uh, because both are very heavy. You know, the swimming pool after all is all water. If you've ever come four pints of milk back from Tesco, you know how heavy water is. Um, and I think there are only half a dozen developments in the world where you have a swimming pool and a, uh, another development, one above uh, each other. And uh, when I went to take some photographs of the development, they had to dig down really deep for the sports centre because they needed to have the foundations to take the weight of, of that building. But a very iconic building of its time, again in the 1930s, it put Streatham on the map, 
you know, there are very few places that have an ice rink, and Streatham was one of them. And with the ice rink, we had a very successful ice hockey team. And so, for example, teams from Canada, teams from Scandinavia would come to Britain and they would play international matches at the Streatham Ice Rink. So it really was a, a, a substantial venue. But we still have an ice rink in Streatham. Um, and uh, that was a part of the condition of the redevelopment uh, of the site. Uh, you say the glass, the, the ceiling is still there. The, well, the panel from the swimming pool, there was the, the dolphin ceiling, mm. the dolphin stained glass. Mm. That has been incorporated into the new swimming pool, yes. Mm. Um, so presumably there must be upstairs then if there's light coming through. Oh, they've lit it from above. Oh, they've lit it from above, yeah. above yes. Uh, I, can't, a lovely, lovely I, I have seen it, but I can't remember. Mm. Oh, yes, I can't remember. Sadly, my... As you can see from my size, I hardly go skating. <laughs> but yes. So yes. I, I can only do this from on my back. So I, oh, well, you'll see it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, yes. Yes. Well, I think it is nice that those um, quite small, really, tokens of what stood there before have been, have been preserved. And I should mention to you that Stretton Meister appeared in a number of films. Uh, John Mills starred in a film in the 1930s, a very early film that was um, uh, filmed at the ice rink, and we'll be seeing a section of that film at our meeting on the uh, 7th of June. And um, another famous American actor, um, whose name I've now forgotten, came to Britain to make a film, and he had to skate in the film. And so he came down to Stratham Ice Rink, and they taught him to skate in two weeks. Uh, and when you see the film he starred in, I wish I could remember his name. Can but you remember when, the film? Uh, no, I can't remember the film. But uh, when you see the film in which he's, he's skating, he's on screen for about 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and yet he came to Stratton for two weeks to learn to skate. It's quite, quite a surprise. Any more questions? Yes? Uh, no. Please. Uh, just, the same Stratton wasn't part of London originally. No. When did it become part of Yes, uh, Streatham was a parish in Surrey. And hence, um, uh, up until 1899, uh, to the formation of what later became the London County Council and subsequently the GLC, Streatham was in Surrey. And it was only with the gradual development of municipal government after 1855 that places like Stratton was, was treating Putney, gradually became absorbed into London. And um, at the time my father was born, which was before the First World War, Stratton was still fields, and you've got the sense that you were in London. But in 1855, they started grouping parishes together. Prior to that, the, the church, St. Leonard's Church, would be responsible for administering so many civic functions in the parish. But then they felt the first thing they did, they had the surveyor of the highways, so that went to a county level. Then they had the Metropolitan Board of Works. So Stretton gradually found itself as being um, one of a group of five parishes, one of a group of six parishes doing these things. And then those parishes became Wandsworth, and Wandsworth became part of the LCC. And so the London County Council was in existence. Um, I think it was came into existence in 1899. By Act of Parliament to take effect in 1900. And up until the mid 1960s, Streatham was wholly in Wandsworth. And it was only after the reorganization of London um, municipal government um, that two thirds of Streatham uh, became part of Lambeth and one third became part of Wandsworth, which is the third we are in today. Uh, and contrary to what you see um, in um, road signs and placards, um, first down area is a part of the ancient parish of Streatham, not the ancient parish of Tooting. Tooting, Gravely Parish, is the small, was the smallest parish in Surrey uh, and was for many years. So Ballam, Upper Tooting, Tooting Beck, first down were all part of Streatham Parish. So you have the situation where um, the, the Mayor of London, who lives, what, 25 yards from where we are today, um, lives in Streatham. Although he says he lives in Tooting. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing now? Is it sort of like an the buses out so that you go on the FD at the right to tell them there is a little boy, isn't it? You see, I don't know. I was on the news today. Oh, right. A lot of the buses that go around that area. 
Oh, right. so you've got on the tube. So you have to go on the tube when you might go or not. Right. Well, we haven't got a tube in Stretton, so we haven't got that problem. No, 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 no. <laughs> the problem is that one of the masses that come into Stretton have got out. Well, who knows? Use it or lose it, isn't it, really? Yeah. Right, well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.